All right, good morning, TFC. I hope the cold doesn't have you down, but let's go ahead and stand up and worship our wonderful creator this morning.
ask that you have the Holy Spirit put it on our hearts to submit to your will for us, Lord, that when there are multiple ways for us to go, we ask you what way, rather than just running into obstacles that we put there ourselves. And Lord, we just thank you for having your son die on the cross to remove the obstacle of sin for us, so that he is our communication to you, Lord, so that we can communicate with you. And we just pray that we always ask for guidance from you in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, this morning we are continuing our series in Ephesians. So last week we dove into the topic of sexuality with Ephesians 5. Um, and today we are continuing in Ephesians 5, specifically focusing on the topic of submission, um, which, as you know, can be kind of a spicy uh, topic. So I was really looking for someone who uh, was seasoned in ministry to tackle this topic. Um, I'm delighted to have our uh, speaker here this morning, Dr. Mick Knoll. Uh, Dr. Knoll has been in ministry uh, with the Christian Missionary Alliance for over 40 years, and he currently serves as the district superintendent uh, over a district known as the Alliance South. Um, and what this means for you that uh, don't understand how the CMA is divided up and how all that works is um, we have this district called the Alliance South, and it spans this geographical region from Mississippi to North Carolina. So any churches affiliated with the CMA um, are kind of all a part of this district. And uh, Dr. Noel is a leader over that region. So there's over, uh, or actually, almost over 135 churches, possibly 136 by the end of this month. Uh, and Dr. Noel and his team are, cover all of that. Um, they represent uh, over 18 languages as well, which is exciting. Um, so there's a lot that rests upon uh, the shoulders of this team. Um, we are so excited to have Dr. Noel here this morning. Uh, please welcome him with me. Well, passage of scripture to talk about today, not popular and not politically correct, so let's dig in. If you have your Bibles or your phone, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start with verse 17. While you're finding your place, let me just uh, encourage you that you're currently in a Christian community that you probably will not experience again the rest of your life. There's something special about a Christian college. There's something special about the available resources to you among the faculty and staff here who all know Jesus, who are all sold out to his uh, lordship in their life, and not only because of their knowledge, but because of their life experiences, uh, they have a lot to offer. So I hope you won't settle for uh, the, the sheepskin, uh, fulfilling the academic requirements. I hope you'll also take advantage of the faculty and staff friendships and the mutual friendships you have with each other and learn as much as you can. It will equip you well for the days ahead. Submission. When I say that word, what comes to your mind? This is audience participation. Submission. What comes to mind? Speak up loud. Okay, <laughs> so that's submitting. <laughs> Submission. To obey. To obey, okay. Running toward God. Okay. Sacrifice. 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 Good. Ah. Anyone else? Submission. 
Well, for, forgive me, but when I started thinking about this word, what came to mind was a wrestling match where, where my goal, any, any wrestlers in the audience? Okay, we've got a couple. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, my, my goal is to get you to admit defeat, <laughs> to submit to, to, to the hold that I have upon you. And so when you lose, I win. When you submit, I win. Well, let me assure you that is not at all what is in mind here in, in God's Word. This is not what, what Paul has in mind when he talks to us about submission. And it kind of illustrates why it's important for us to talk about this uh, today. Let me begin by giving you uh, a few words to kind of capture what it means biblically to submit. When I submit to another, I am demonstrating to them that I value them as a person, that I respect them, that I appreciate them. And so as we come to this passage of Scripture, uh, there's just three takeaways that I have for you today, but it all involves how we view one another. Submission for most of us is kind of a ne has negative connotations, and we want to avoid it. But in Christian community, submission is who we are. We are mutual submitters to one another, and as the, as the passage will explain, there's good reason for that. And so the first takeaway is simply this. Spirit empowerment is the critical premise for all that follows in Paul's statement to us. Spirit empowerment is the critical premise for all that follows. Christians are spirit empowered. And so, verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now the biblical definition of, of being foolish is to disregard God. The fool has said in, in his or her heart, there is no God. Now maybe you're not that bold, you're pretty well convinced there is a God. But there are many people who live as if there is no God, even Christians from time to time. On more than one occasion, I have sat with those in conflict and said, now tell me again how your behavior reflects your commitment to Jesus. And what typically follows is a blank stare or people staring at their shoelaces because they don't want to make eye contact. Paul here says, therefore, on account of all that's been said already, don't act foolishly. Don't act as if there's no God. But understand what God's will is. Uh, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so he warns us uh, against being substance controlled. Don't allow things to control you that will lead you into, in this translation it says debauchery, uh, excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. Don't let anything control you, but God's Spirit. And when God's Spirit controls you, you can expect there'll be certain outcomes. First of all, you'll speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Minister to each other. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Minister or worship God. And then always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so these three outcomes are evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been around a few years, and I've encountered a lot of Christians in a lot of different environments. And every now and again, someone will announce, as they're introducing themselves to me, they'll say, you know, and I'm spirit-filled. You know anybody like that? Don't, don't put your hands up. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you have that self-awareness, but what I'm more impressed with is, is not your profession of being spirit-filled. What I'm really looking for is your behavior pattern. Does your behavior demonstrate that, in fact, you're in relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, and not only indwelling you, but has control of your mind, will, and emotions? Don't be foolish. Understand what God's will is. God's will is that we be filled by his Spirit and that our lives begin to demonstrate that fullness. So don't tell me you're spirit-filled. Show me. And as we look around, as we help each other to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be while we're here at TFC, we should look for ways to mutually encourage one another. We should continue to engage in worship, living in God's presence, and we should be a thankful people. One of the things that's in short supply today in, the, in this culture 
is thankfulness. We tend to be better at finding fault than giving thanks. The seedbed for thankfulness is not simply the decision that I'm going to be a thankful person, but it's gratitude. Gratitude is the seedbed from which thankfulness grows. And so, are you thankful for all that God's done for you? Are you thankful for what Jesus has provided for you, not only by way of salvation, but by way of his spirit to indwell you? And a promise of a future? A promise of a significant and meaningful life? A promise of being on mission with him to accomplish something far grander than any one life life, uh, span can contain. The first thing we need to take away, and and this is so important to understand what follows, is that spirit empowerment is the critical premise for all that follows. And those who truly know Jesus are spirit-filled and spirit-empowered. The the Christian life is not a matter of doing the best you can. It's not a matter of self-reform. It's not a matter of using all of your muscle fibers to get it done. It's a matter of allowing the Spirit of God to fill you and change you and use you. And so that's the first takeaway. The second one follows closely with it. Mutual submission is a distinctly Christian community standard. That's why we don't hear much about it out in the world around us. That's why Hollywood doesn't talk about it. That's that's why Madison Avenue doesn't talk about it. That's why Washington, D.C. doesn't talk about it. Because it's a distinctly Christian system of behavior. Well, the core relational dynamic that emerges from being spirit-filled is the, the very ability to practice mutual submission. Loving mutual submission, valuing one another, respecting one another, appreciating one another, encompasses all the New Testament teaches about Christians and how we are to be in relationship with each other. The dynamic is a reflection of the Spirit of God living in me and among us as we congregate together in Jesus' name. Any person you meet for the rest of your life, there are a few things that you know before you know their name. They were created in the image of God. They were created with eternity implanted in them. They were created purposefully by God. And so if we really believe that as more than an academic understanding, then it causes me to look at everyone I meet in a little bit different way. And I want to value them. I want to respect them. I want to appreciate what they bring into relationship. Now, we need to admit that it's not normal. (laughs) It's not normal to engage in mutual submission. We have this carnality which we're born with. Anybody have a a two-year-old brother or sister, niece or nephew? Okay, you know what I'm talking about, right? For a two-year-old, all the universe is condensed to what they want. When, when they want it, right? I, I've, got, I've got a grandchild in that age bracket right now. And yeah, for him, it doesn't matter what, others, what else is going on in the family, it's all about little, little Marcello and what he wants or what he thinks he wants and what he needs. Well, that's the behavior of a two-year-old. Hopefully, by the time you get to be college students, we've put that behind us and we've come to realize that the universe is bigger than me. It's bigger than what I want, what I need. It includes others, roommates, classmates, campus mates, the people I work with. It's important that we understand that. But not only that we understand that, we understand what the Scriptures teach us about this other relationship, this reflection of the Spirit of God living in me, which enables me to act not out of my carnality, but out of my spiritual resources. The two-year-old starts with a me-first context. As we grow to adulthood, as we grow in Christ, we come to realize that the best path forward is not me-first, but let's meet together and go together. 
You, you remember with me, and I won't recite everything here, but 56 statements in the New Testament reflect 23 or so expressions of submission, loving mutual submission. Uh, the most uh, memorable one is made by Jesus himself. As I've loved you, love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples because of this loving one another behavior. It's interesting to me that he doesn't say that you will demonstrate that you belong to me because of your knowledge of me. He says, you will demonstrate that you belong to me because of the way it tra- your knowledge, your, your relationship with me transforms you into someone who can love others. And so... You're at a Bible college. You know all these things. Be devoted to one another. Live in harmony with one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Agree with one another so there's no divisions among you. Serve one another. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs, spiritual songs. Submit to one another. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Teach and admonish one another, encourage one another, build one another up, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Again, encourage one another. Do not slander one another. Love one another deeply, Peter says. Offer hospitality to one another. It's one of my favorites. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. And then greet one another. Acknowledge what a, what, a, what a simple thing to say, greet one another. But when I greet you, and particularly if I'm able to greet you by name, I'm acknowledging you're a real person. And I'm acknowledging that I value you enough to, to learn your name and to, to acknowledge what God is, is doing in you. And then, if we walk in the light, as Jesus is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. Now, the practice of the one another's that we've just identified is critical for the establishment and sustainability of Christian community. This is not an add-on. This is not something I, I hope to attain in the third quarter of my life. It is the essence of being a Christ follower. Mutual submission contrasts dramatically with our human inclination. In the flesh, you know what my preferred pronouns are? Me, myself, and I, right? And if we were being honest here this morning, we'd all say, that's right, that's our preferred pronoun. We like to start with us as the center, me, myself, and I. But in Christ, we set that aside and say, no, I value you. I want to learn from you. I want to contribute to you. I want to walk with you. I want us, I want us to demonstrate together in relationship what it means to be followers of Christ. Now, the enemy of mutual submission is the reemergence of self, which competes with the spirit for control. You may want to write this down. Until we reach heaven... Now, the Christian Missionary Alliance is a sanctification movement. We believe in sanctification. We believe the Holy Spirit is active in us and changing us and transforming us and helping us to confess and repent of sin and, and to conform to the image of Christ. And all that's going on all, all of our life, but still we've got this old self which competes for control with the Spirit of God. And, and that's, that's why, from time to time, we, we have an issue with one another. Sometimes both of us, at the same time, begin to kind of act out of our Christian character. We, we just leave that behind, and we go after each other on the basis of our self-centered perspective. Conflict and community follows when mutual submission is subverted by meism. One of the things a district superintendent does is he goes from conflict to conflict among the people of God. And so I'm headed to a church tonight, and I'll sit with their board, and they're dealing with an issue, and we'll try to remember Jesus in the midst of that conflict. Whenever conflict breaks out, it's because meism has asserted itself. And so when you find yourself in conflict with another student, with a professor, uh, with anyone, 
you can expect that to be the outcome until, it is, uh, until we realize what's going on. Now, this isn't a new, new phenomenon. The, the 12 established this. Uh, the 12 experienced this. Jesus poured himself into these, these 12 men and others who were following around him, trying to teach them about the one another's. And he'd get them together for a meal, and they would compete with each other for, for who should sit closest to Jesus. One set of disciples' mother-in-law came in, tried to influence Jesus to make her sons the preeminent among the disciples, competing with each other. So conflict and community follows when mutual submission is subverted, is subverted by meism. Notice the verse 20, 21, the second part of the verse. Out of reverence for Christ, we are called to submit to one another. Out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission is an expression of deep respect for Christ and all he has done for us. The church as his body and the importance of the behavior which, which reflects him in us calls us to remember Jesus in our relationships. And that relationship is demonstrated by mutual submission. Not with a winner and a loser, but mutual valuing, mutual esteeming, mutual thankfulness. Which leads us to the third takeaway. Beginning in verse 22, and this is the one which I may get into trouble with. Beginning in verse 22, we, we have these statements about marriage. And let me simply say we're talking here about Christian marriage. Uh, we live in a world of confusion, of trying to redefine what marriage is. We're talking about Christian marriage. If you come to me and, and ask uh, me to marry you and your husband or wife, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, do you realize what you're asking me to do? You're asking me to have a worship service in which we invite God to participate in, in welcoming you together as husband and wife, because it is essentially a special kind of relationship that, that is defined in Scripture. And it's, it's not simply a contract or even a covenant. or it, it's, it's, not, it's not merely a civil matter. It's, it's an act of, of mutuality that supersedes all other forms of mutual appreciation before God. I'll let you read the passage and reflect on it. And go back to your Bible and theology professors and have them parse it with you. But there are some relationships that are spoken of here by Paul. Wives, husbands. But then he morphs into this conversation about Jesus, or about God, about Jesus and his church. How the church responds to Jesus. How husbands ought to respond to wives. How wives ought to respond to husbands. Verse 31 tells us that it is a relationship, husband and wife that supersedes all other relationships. We're, we're thankful. We're particularly thankful for our mothers. Some of us are also thankful for our fathers. But we're thankful for our mothers because there's a kind of bond that's uh, it's hard to imagine anything more important. But here Paul seems to be saying, you know, God has ordered that we'll leave our mother and father and we'll cleave to a mate and we'll become one in a way that is different from everything else. Well, what, what's going on here? The first thing I would suggest that we think about is that this teaching can be easily misunderstood and ultimately it becomes unattainable when it's seen as primarily prescriptive rather than descriptive. What do I mean by that? Well, if we see this as prescription, husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church, wives respect your husbands as the church respects Christ, and we go at it as some kind of formula, then it is inevitable that something's going to happen. First of all, uh, we're going to get into a competition. Uh, imagine a tug of war. Respect me. Respect me. Respect No, no, no. Love me like Christ. Love me like Christ. And, and it becomes a competition that's not winnable. If it's a formula, I can also defer my responsibility in the marriage, in the relationship. You know, I could, I could love you like Christ loves the church if you just respected me better. Or, you know, I don't feel the love from you, 
so I'm not going to respect you. And so it, it, be, it becomes something less than what Paul's talking about. It's, it's not primarily prescriptive, though the elements are there that can help us to find a path forward. It is descriptive of this thing we're calling mutual submissiveness. It's, it's not so much a formula for success as a description of what godly mutuality looks like. Now you say to me, Mick, I've known a lot of, a lot of marriages that didn't look like that. Let me say again, we're talking about Christian marriage, how marriage is supposed to work. It's what godly mutuality is supposed to look like. Now there is a metaphor of the relationship of Christ and his church that Paul uses to illustrate the marriage relationship of mutuality. Jesus gave it all for his bride. He gave it all, his life, so there'd be a possibility of the church being born, of the church being cleansed, of the church having an eternal future with God. Jesus paid the he, all in, died on the cross, was resurrected. The church, in turn, when Christians are walking rightly with God, don't hold anything back. We have ultimate respect for our God, ultimate thankfulness and gratitude for what he's given to us, and so we're going to give it all back. We are all in the relationship. That's what Paul's talking about. This is what is possible for a dynamic, healthy relationship. So, the standard for husbands is Christ, who willingly gave up his life for the benefit of his bride, the church, who sought the perfecting or completing of his spouse, by his actions. The union of a husband and wife is the ultimate expression of mutuality superseding the relationship of parents and children. As wife and husband choose an other-centered life as opposed to a self-centered one, they are able by the Holy Spirit's empowerment to experience this kind, this quality of mutual submission. True oneness in marriage is possible as mutual submission replaces the competition of self-interest. Mutuality of submission results in the perfect balance of love and respect. When I fully appreciate you, I, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful God has brought us together. Well, so what? Christian marriage is intended to be a living laboratory of spirit-empowered mutuality. It can and should illustrate the meaning of Christ, of, of Christ honoring spirit-empowered mutual submission. We should be demonstrating to the world the distinction of having the Spirit of God controlling our lives and how we relate to each other. There is no hierarchy here in, in, in what Paul is talking about. It is a mutuality of respect, common interest, all in commitment. Marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. It's a 100%, 100% proposition. And that's the only way this is ever experienced. When I buy the Spirit's transformation of my ego, my will, my desires, can say, you know what, wife, Karen's my wife's name. Karen, what do you need? What do you need from me today? Practicing godly mutual submission does not begin with marriage. It's, it's given an opportunity for full expression in marriage. And so we're learning about it right now in all of our relationships. And I would suggest to you that the most learning comes from the most difficult of relationships. So please don't respond with names, but can you, are you thinking about somebody that's a classmate, a roommate? You just have a hard time with them. You don't personality. You just don't quite click like you like to. And sometimes they say things which trigger you. That's the time to learn about mutuality of submission. These years you have here on campus, two years, four years, maybe longer, <laughs> Let this be, let TFC be a living laboratory of learning godly submission. 
and allowing the Spirit of God to form you in such a way that when you leave here, you will be a dynamo for the kingdom of God. Wherever God leads you, whatever path you go on, you will go taking that mutual uh, submission that you've learned and the Spirit of God learning to control you and you learning to allow the Spirit of God to control you, that will make all the difference. Now, it's learned over time. Next month I will be married for 45 years. I'm still learning. In case Karen's going to watch this later, I'm still learning. And so the takeaways are, are for us. Let's not get bogged down in who does what in marriage. Let's get bogged down in what I do in marriage. And let's begin to learn, to allow the Spirit of God to control me and to transform me so that I'm not consumed with me, myself, and I. But rather, I see Jesus in you, actually or potentially. And I want to live in such a way as you are drawn closer to him. Let us pray together. Lord, across the auditorium, there's all kinds of things going through our minds. We're thinking about some of the relationships we're in right now. And Lord, I pray that you would help us by the power of your spirit not to dismiss what Paul has taught us here but that we would take it very seriously and we would be learning to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in preparation for whatever comes next, whether it's singleness or marriage or whatever kind of relationship you lead us into, Lord. By your spirit, fill these students, change their minds and their hearts, empower them to live in the way that we've just had described. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Go get them. <laughs>